I'm here today, uh, thank you very much for inviting me to, to, to do a TED Talk. It's a real honor. And I'm here to talk about the impact, about why and how the social sciences matter around the new, the old, the young, and technology. I'm going to talk today I, to, about the fastest growing, the most widespread, the most pervasive technology one in which more people seem to have access in some places to this form of technology than food, shelter, and water. What technology am I talk referring to? The mobile phone. For the first time since industrialization, have people around the world had access to communications technology that they've never had before. Six billion people have a mobile phone subscription. And there are 7 billion people in the world. 80% of the world have access to mobile phone subscriptions or using them. This is also happening as we've had this widespread increase of this technology. At the same time, we're seeing significant shifts in our aging population. Between 1970 and 2025, the percentage of people over the age of 65 increased by over 200%. 80% of people in this demographic are living in developing countries. So my good friend and colleague, Kim Sawchuk at Concordia University, were interested in asking the question about what kind of research has been done about aging and mobile technologies. And it's good researchers. Uh, and one of the reasons why this is important for us to look at is just like as around the world this demographic is changing, it's also changing in Canada. So a third of Canadians will be over the age of 65 in 2050. That's most of you in the audience right now. You are going to make up one of the largest demographics ever of people over 65. One of the interesting things about the challenge for us around this, uh, around this is, is not only has there been this changing demographic for Canadians, um, this is also in a context about, well, how do Canadians use mobile phones? And interestingly, Canadians have been late adopters of mobile technologies. In 1997, only 14% of Canadians had cell phones. And we have to ask ourselves, given how much, and for many of you may have known that Canada was a leader in internet infrastructure. Uh, Canada has been the most significant uh, uptake of digital banking. Why did it take us so long to take up cell phones? Well, one of the reasons is that we have had one of the best landlines uh, infrastructure in the world. We've had some of the most affordable, reliable, and accessible landlines. This, has a, 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 this is partially because we've had an, uh, a telecommunications policy that within the policy, it was a requirement that, that these, these land communication services, the phone, be affordable reliable and accessible. So this represent, represented a significant challenge for telecommunications in Canada. How do you sell mobility to Canadians? So how did they try to sell us mobility? You may remember some of these campaigns. Well, what do you notice about these campaigns? What are they using? Why are they using animals to sell mobility? What's the relationship of animals to mobilities? What's the relationship of animals to mobile technologies? Well, how did they do it? The first campaign, the future is friendly, and we never saw the animals in their context. The second campaign, Fido, the dog. The dog is your friend, they're loyal, they're confidential, there's intimacy around that. And the final campaign, Canada's national icon, the industrious and productive beaver. And for any of you who remember the Frank and Gordon ads, um, it was very interesting how they played in English Canada and French Canada. In French Canada, they were much more romantically involved. <laughs> so that was, it was successful. It was very successful. So bringing in the animals, bringing in nature, if nature is finding it easy, then surely those of us who are cultured are going to find using technologies easy. So we're almost at the same number of uh, use of mobile phones as the rest of the world right now. It's really quite incredible. Uh, and at the same time with some of the highest uh, cell phone costs, but that's another talk on the political economy <laughs> of uh, mobile technologies. 
So given this shift in demographics, given this uptake of this incredible communication technology, my colleague, as I said earlier, Kim Sawchuk and I from Concordia University were interested in what, uh, what did the research say as good researchers? Let's go to the researcher and see, research and see what it says. So what we found when we went to go look at the research is that almost all of the research on how people use mobile technologies was based on young people. Young people between the ages of 8 and 11, 11 and 13, 14 and 17, 18 and 21, 22 to 25. Are you getting my drift? Highly segmented groups of young people. And guess who the old people were? 50 plus. I was with everybody over 50 to 90 in the same group. So I had an aha moment at that time. My own ageism, and also, what was the kind of things that were being said? Because everybody's older than you. What were the kinds of things that were being said about the study of how people use mobile technologies? Well, here's what's their, what, how it's being described. They're in perpetual contact. They're part of thumb tribes. They're the tethered self. They're alone together. They're co-presence. They're always anywhere, anyhow, anytime. And they're always on. All right, so one of the things that you should know when you're a researcher, that once concepts and terms become part of the literature, they become the things that you have to start pushing back against. So I'm kind of concerned about, wow, this hasn't been part of my experience of this technology. What's going on here? Once you go further into the literature, you find out that when they start describing how young people use the literature, they're creative. They're subversive, they're innovative, they're resistant, they're engaged, they're in potential, they're full of possibilities. Do you notice anything that's happening with the young? It's all associated with the things that are new, values that we associate with the new and with, with youth. So what about the old? Why should the old matter to you? And how do old people experience the new? So what I'm about to present you is an adaptation of some of Jake Haydward's work. Well, let's take a look. So you know that group that you're going to be part of in 2050, that you're 65? The group of seniors we interviewed, their average age is 70. They were 7 when the transistor was invented. They were 11 with the first tele color television broadcast. They were 25 when it was possible to dial long distance without an operator. They were 26 when the handheld uh, calculator, and I can tell you, I remember my mom buying one in 1972 for $350, and this was exorbitant <laughs> of something that you can get for like $399. Uh, 27 when the first consumer microwave became available. 37 when personal computers became widely commercially available. 40 when the VHS became format for home video recording. 43 for the audio CDs first hit the market. 53, when the World Wide Web began its period of dramatic growth. 55, when Amazon opened for business. 61, when the first iPod was released. They've experienced a lot of new technologies. So maybe they have something to tell us or something to share with us about what it's like to experience a new technology. So I'm going to share with you three kinds of observations that have resulted from the work that we've been doing with talking to seniors in Canada. What do they have to say about new technologies? My first one of the first observations is that, um, like young people, infrastructure shapes how people interact with the technology and how they use it. And actually, young people and old people share something in common, restricted incomes. They do not have access to the same kind of capital. And what we find is that some of our seniors have showed a lot of innovation, resistance, creativity, potential, engagement and possibilities, and subversive activities with mobile technologies. They've developed, uh, they use ringtones for a family move member. They use caller ID. They've figured out too that you can access 911 without a mobile subscription, so they use their phones to have access to 911. And also, they've even come up with new terms to describe their mobile technologies. We had one couple who talked about how they use their phone as a spousal locator. <laughs> so we've got to be looking. The second observation is that seniors 
uh, are the fastest growing users of social media. It's not that they're not interested in new media or the media. They're interested in particular kinds of media. And the media that they like the most is Skype. And it's important for them to, to hear what they have to say about Skype and communication. They value the face-to-face. -face. They value seeing and having access to bodily cues to understand communication. The final observation they make is, what is a technology? They remind us to ask the question, what is a technology? And for one of our 81-year-old seniors who received a hand-me-down phone, and many of them do receive hand-me-down phones, uh, uh, decided to try out her cell phone and walking from her Winnipeg apartment to the store. And as for many of you who know Winnipeg in the winter, it can be icy and cold. And as she walked out with her cell phone, she realized she'd rather have a whistle than a phone. <laughs> so reminding us. So today I hope that you think about the relationship between the young and the new, the new and the old. You will be old one day. <laughs> And why the social science and why the social sciences are important is because the social sciences bring people to the discussions of technology. And my work with um, uh, First Nations people remind us that there's nothing about us without us. Thank you.